first of all, we thank you for being with us today. And a uh, very big thanks to Dr. Swanson for accepting our invitation for today. Uh, it's such a pleasure, of course. Uh, well, let me introduce Dr. Swanson in case you don't uh, know much about him. Dr. John Swanson is currently the Associate Provost at the American University in Cairo. He also holds the title of Joint Professor of Egyptology and History, which he was awarded in 2011. At various times over the past decade, he has served as a director of AAC School Curriculum uh, and director of international programs. From 1989 to uh, 2009, Dr. Swanson participated in many of AAC's major outreach efforts organizing programs of lectures for visiting college and university groups from the United States and Europe. He also served as the lecturer and uh, study leader for many Smithsonian Institution uh, travel programs in Egypt, Turkey, uh, Syria, Jordan, and Arabian Peninsula. Uh, Dr. Swanson joined AC in 1978 after completing a PhD in African history at Indiana University. From 1981 to 1989, he was the director of uh, AC's Arabic language uh, unit and Cairo co-director of uh, CASA or the Center, of, uh, Center for Arabic Study Abroad, a program dedicated to providing advanced inst uh, instruction in Egypt uh, in Arabic language to outstanding American students of Arabic. Please welcome with me Dr. John Spanson. First of all, I do want to thank all of you for coming out on a Monday evening. I, it took me forever to come in from New Cairo. The traffic is really bad today. And I'm very grateful that you're here. Uh, very grateful to the, to, to the School of Continuing Education. I, I made a, I don't know if it sounded like a joke or a slight comment. I used to lecture in this hall all of the time. And then we moved out to New Cairo. And I think this is the first time that I've been back in this hall speaking now since 2008. Uh, and so I'm really very grateful for the opportunity. Now, whether or not you're going to be getting much out of this talk, I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. Uh, but I don't mean that entirely as a joke. Let me explain my purpose. And you might have noticed that I went from the slide that I had set up to start the lecture and started leading through things. And that's partly because I was thinking I probably should start in a slightly different way than I intended. I'll get back to that start, by the way. But I was going to show you some slides of some famous things in Egypt. And then immediately say, but I'm not going to talk about that. I've already said that to you. Uh, I'm going to talk about something else. And that is true. But I actually probably need to explain that better. And I really do mean what I said earlier about how there's a degree to which the School of Continuing Education's dedication to lifelong learning, encouraging people to learn, to give the opportunity to learn something new, is something that appeals to me enormously. And this is partly because. Now, by the way, there's a confession coming up. Unlike many of the other lectures in this series, and if you've been to them, you will soon discover what I mean. I am not one of the faculty of AEC who's going to present exciting new ideas that are, that are the result of my research. I am an administrator. I spend most of my days sitting in my office writing relatively boring but necessary memos. Um, I do get to teach classes on occasion for the Egyptology program. And that's something that I find not only very, very fun, it's also something that I need as an alternative to sitting in the office all of the time. But one of the things that I don't have very much time to do is engage in the kind of academic research that, that most of my faculty colleagues at AEC have done and have done very, very well. Uh, what I do try to do is keep up as best as I can. And one of the things that I particularly try to do is learn new things. And I often run across things that cause me to go running off in strange directions. I'll give you an example of what I mean, and it relates to this slide, which is why I thought maybe I should start here. I'm associated with the Egyptology program at AUC. This book was given to AUC as a gift by one of the former presidents of AUC, <coughs> Richard Peterson, who was the president from 1978 up until about 1989. He was here during a period when there were all sorts of problems that had to be faced, when the university's financial circumstances were difficult, 
It was an extremely difficult job, but he loved the work. He loved ABC. He loved Egypt. When he retired, he went back to the United States. And then several years later, he was offered an honorary degree by ABC. And he decided that when he came out to receive the degree, he would also give a gift to the university. And what he thought about was getting a very special book and offering it to the university library. So the, the story that I heard him tell is that he went into old bookstores in New York City. And as he was rummaging around in one of them, he found this. <coughs> now, this is exactly as the book is today. It's kept in ABC Special Collection. Um, it has a binding. It's been rebound since it was originally written. I should even say written, by the way. This is a printed book. It was printed in about the year 1602. So this book is something on the order right now of 400 years old. It's one of the not oldest printed books in the world, but the art of printing was only invented a century before this book was printed, so it does go back to the beginnings of the printed book. And in fact, this is, I think this is the fourth edition of this particular book, which means that this book was so popular that it was printed and then reprinted and then reprinted many times all the way back in the 16th century. And so our copy <coughs> was around about the year 1600. Now, the reason why Dr. Peterson, the former president, bought this book is because he opened it up to the first page, and there he saw the title. Now, at the very top of the page is the name of the author, Johannes Pierre Valeriani. That actually, by the way, is in a genitive form, so it means by uh, Johann Piero Valeriani. Valeriani is an Italian name. It's actually a pen name, and I'll talk a little bit more about this guy later on. But Valeriani was an immensely well-known and popular author among intellectuals in Europe in the late 16th century. And what he was best known for is this book. And you can see the main title of this book just four lines down from the top. Hieroglyphica. And all of that, by the way, should mean something to you. Hieroglyphica, hieroglyphs. And the book is a book about hieroglyphs. So here is a very old book, going back even before the beginnings of modern Egyptology, written in Europe about hieroglyphs. And he thought this would make a perfect gift for ABC. He had a special interest in ancient Egypt in particular. He thought the Egyptologists would be thrilled to be able to work with this book. Now, the book did go into our special collections. So far as I know, other than me, none of the Egyptologists at AEC have ever paid any attention to it. And that's actually part of the point of the story that I'm telling you, because it turns out that this is a book that is entirely dedicated to explaining what hieroglyphs were and how they worked 300 years before Champollion, the famous Frenchman, figured out how hieroglyphs were and what they were. And in fact, this man's interpretation of hieroglyphs, which fills up this entire book, this man's interpretation of hieroglyphs by the understanding of all modern scholars is complete nonsense. Yet this was an extraordinarily popular book among the greatest minds in Europe at the end of the 16th century. It went into many editions, which meant that people were buying the book at a time when not many people could afford to buy books. And the people who bought this book were among the greatest intellectuals of the day. And they thought this book had something very important to tell them. And one of the things, by the way, that was important to tell them is that it told them a great deal about ancient Egypt and what ancient Egypt was, who the ancient Egyptians were, and why ancient Egypt is so important. And this is at a time 400 years ago when very few Europeans then, or before, or even for the next two to three hundred years, had ever been to Egypt. There were merchants and travelers who came in and out of the port of Alexandria, but very, very few Europeans, since the time of the Greeks and the Romans, had traveled up the Nile from Alexandria to visit the pyramids, for example. Most people in Europe, at the time that this book was written, only knew about the pyramids from two sources. One is the Bible, the other are a small number of books written by famous Greek and Roman authors that survived at that time. 
And the Greeks and the Romans, as you might know, and if you don't, you should, were fascinated by ancient Egypt. And they wrote about the things in ancient Egypt. But that was pretty much it. That's what people in Europe in the 16th century knew about Egypt, except this book was part of the development of what I would argue is the first European Egyptology. And some of you may have already studied this. Some of you might know about this. If you do, I'm just going to have to apologize because I'm going to run over to Ken. But if you're not aware of this, modern Egyptology, that is all of these guys who go out and they're digging things up, and there are the men and the women who you see, it's hard enough to think of Dr. Halas wearing his cap out on the site and talking about this and that. And I know that Dr. Halas can be a very controversial figure, but whatever you may think about him, he loves Egypt. And he focuses entirely on trying to get people interested in Egypt, and that reflects his own interest in the country and in the country's past. And he deserves credit for all of that. He is a founding Egyptologist. You all have seen Egyptologists on television. You all know about the history of looking for tombs and things like this. This is what we call Egyptology, the study of Egypt. It's only, however, some 200 years old. That is, Egyptology as we know it goes back to the beginning of the 19th century and not much earlier. And while we're on this, and by the way, I am infamous for talking around things before I get to my point, but what I'm talking around is part of the point. Egyptology. Ology in Greek means science or study of. Egyptology should therefore mean the science or study of Egypt. So how come most Egyptologists, who are not Egyptians, cannot read, write, or speak Arabic? How come they don't know very much about Egypt other than the Egypt of the Pharaohs? That is, how is it, if you're an expert on Egypt, you know about two to 3,000 years of Egypt's history, which is very important, but what about what follows? What about Greco-Roman Egypt, the Egypt of Alexandria? when you could argue that, in effect, a scientific and intellectual revolution that would have enormous impact on the modern world, even if it was delayed many, many centuries, took place, and it took place here in Egypt and Alexandria. Or what about the medieval period, when Cairo was the great generative center, in my opinion, of Arab Islamic civilization? If you're studying Egypt, should you study all of these things? If, by the way, you're a Sinologist, said so as somebody who studies China, you don't think of China as something that began 5,000 years ago and then stopped 2,000 years ago, and then you pay no attention to what came after that. And I've always found this very strange about ancient Egypt. But as I said, I think that actually kind of fits into the theme that I want to address right now. If you forgive me for a moment, let me get to my real starting point, and I'll come back to that book and why it is I find that book fascinating. But I need to give you some background to this before I can do that. So I'll get back to that first slide that I had up. This is the slide of the Temple of Karnak down in Luxor. And you're looking at the most famous part of the temple, which is the Great Hypostyle Hall. I love this image, by the way. This is taken from the north of the temple. Uh, usually you have photographs inside the Hypostyle Hall, so you see the big columns all rising up. But you really get a sense, looking at this from the north, of the sheer scale of the monument and the fact that it is a coherent building. Now, the title that I put here is The Idea of Egypt, colon, The Power of the Past. Um, I wasn't really sure what the title should be when they asked me to do this talk six months ago, so that's what I gave them. By the way, in retrospect, at the very least, it should have been The Idea of Egypt and The Power of the but what I'm trying to get at here is that part of what I'm talking about is the way in which the idea of Egypt, the image of Egypt, enters into people's imaginations and then takes on a power of its own, a power so great that it shapes the people who have taken in that conception of Egypt. Whether or not the Egypt that they have translated into their imaginations is actually something that never existed. It's the idea of Egypt itself that has had a power throughout, really, almost all of the last three to 4,000 years, back at the time of the Greeks and the Romans, that is very hard to be defined with almost any other civilization or any other country. And I'm not just saying that because I'm trying to butter up the <coughs> Egyptians. 
I'm saying that in part because I find it overwhelming the extent to which people, even today, and you can especially see the day by going on the internet, are just overwhelmed by things in Egypt. And then they take those things and seek to use them to demonstrate something else. Did the ancient Egyptians build the pyramids? By the way, I don't know what your answers are. If I ask that to a question of my students, if I have 30 students, half of them are going to say yes. The other half know they're supposed to say yes. But since they just saw the television show Ancient Aliens on OSN the night before, where they learned about that actually the pyramids were built by, and now you can pick your choice. They were built by a New Age society that existed 10,000 years ago and has since disappeared, but had a technology far advanced. Or they were built by aliens. By the way, the spaceships of the aliens are still in a big open space that's right beneath the Great Pyramid. And whenever I say that, people joke. This is not a joke. This goes back to, now this is in the early 19, I won't say 1900s, in the early 2000s. I was going out to Giza, and I went to the, the, inspect, the chief inspector's office. And Dr. Halax, who was then the director of the Antiquities Organization, was there. And he was in his office. And I was there with a few people because we were getting permission to visit something. And this is not a joke. As we were there, two foreigners just walked into the office. And they said, where's your bathroom? Looking at Dr. Hawass. And he looked at them and laughed. And the rest of us are sitting there looking at one another going, a bathroom? And these people wanted to go to the bathroom so they could take photographs of it. Now, why would you want to photograph the bathroom of Dr. Hawass in the Antiquities Organization office? And by the way, it was not because it was Dr. Hawass's office. It was because it was the office. And because according to the internet, there is a tunnel that goes down from beneath the bathroom, cuts underground over to beneath the Great Pyramid, and it gets to the huge open space beneath the pyramid where the spaceships of the aliens are actually kept and also where the bodies and mummies of the ancient aliens are. And that was not a joke. You could go on the internet and find lots of discussion about this, together with a lot of criticism of Dr. Hawass and other officials in Egypt, because they would not let the truth come out. And nowadays, there are things like that that you can find about other aspects of ancient Egypt. And you might think that some of this is silly. I find some of it silly. Many people find it very profound. There are whole treatises that I could direct you to if you're interested, proving that the pyramids of Egypt are huge power generators that are all based on a certain kind of electrical energy that can be generated by certain types of granite in the right sort of circumstances where it's channeled through the back, and so on and so on and so on. There are vast tomes about this, and I guarantee you, if you go look on the internet, type in Giza Power Plant, something like that, you'll get a whole series of descriptions about how the ancient Egyptians, well, actually, it's not clear whether it was the ancient Egyptians who had this technology. It's whoever built the pyramids had this technology. And now we get back to that point. There's something about Egypt that this is, this is not something that's brand new. People have been talking about these things since the Greeks and the Romans came to Egypt. And every generation, it may be something new, What's never new is the way in which it's focused on Egypt. Now, by the way, and I will apologize for this in advance, but I could make a very powerful argument that the culture and civilization of ancient Iraq produced more in the way of science and mathematics and things that became part of the world tradition going back three and four or 5,000 years ago than ancient Egypt did. This is not a criticism of either culture. A lot of it had to do with the unique circumstances in which culture found itself. It had to do with how many outside countries and civilizations and cultures a given culture could interact with. I don't mean that negatively. But almost nobody is interested in ancient Iraq to the sense that they are fascinated by ancient Egypt. It's Egypt that is always developing. And I want to spend about 40 minutes giving an explanation of this and then maybe we can talk with one another during the break afterwards about what this may or may not mean. Now, some of you have just come in. I started out with the intention of showing a series of photographs, mostly as kind of a clever start. Uh, it was not going to be really that clever. But it had to do with the fact that if you're going to talk about Egypt,
The question is, what each of you are going to talk about? And one of the problems you have to deal with is that even in historical terms, there are a number of different Egypts, and the problem is we treat them as being very different from one another. There's Hegelo Egypt, the Egypt of the 19th century and the Hadiths. And as a couple of you pointed out, this is part of the great palace of Muhammad Ali that still survives in Shubra. And it's a really quite extraordinary building if you ever have a chance to visit it. Or there is Islamic Egypt, the great Egypt of the Middle Ages, the great genitive center of Arab Islamic civilization. And some of the greatest examples of not just Arab Islamic architecture, but of rural architecture built during the medieval period are here in Cairo. This is the one that stumped most people. This is one of the largest surviving medieval monasteries in Egypt. It's located in Aswan, the monastery of St. Sanan, or St. Hudra, properly. It's a huge structure built in the 8th century, and it's very emblematic of another period in Egypt's history, or the Greco-Roman period of Alexandria, with sites like Comedica and Alexandria. And by the way, I, I just feel compelled to stop here. It doesn't even have that much to do with my talk, but I just said that this is Greco-Roman Egypt, which is a story in its own right. My guess is that many of you have been to this site. It's one of the places that almost everybody visits when they go to Alexandria, even if they don't want to. But there is something peculiar about this. Most tourists to Egypt don't go to Alexandria. The travel business in Egypt is almost entirely built around ancient Egypt. You spend a day in Cairo, I mean, the travel business is built around the idea that most people come to Egypt for about two weeks. That's the kind of vacation you can get. If you're wealthy enough that you can afford to do one of these tours to Egypt. You come to Egypt, it takes you, by the way, two to three days to get here and to get home. So now you're down to about 11 days in country. So the agent now has to decide what is really necessary for this group of people to see. And usually you have a half a day or a day for quote-unquote Islamic Cairo, which is one of the mosques, and then you go to Hanukkah Lili Bazaar, which is okay, although I wish they would see more of the mosque. And I say that because this is one of my areas especially, which is medieval Cairo. But most of their time is spent visiting ancient Egyptian monuments. And here's the interesting thing. It's not because there's a bias in the travel business in Europe and the United States against visiting, for example, Islamic monuments. You just don't come to Egypt to see Islamic monuments. You do your trip to Turkey to see Islamic monuments. And there's wonderful mosques, the great dome structures of the Ottoman period in Istanbul that are just absolutely spectacular. I just think they're equally spectacular buildings in Cairo. But the travel business is the way the travel business is. You want to see Islamic monuments, you go to Turkey. That's just the way it is. But well, why don't they go to Alexandria, which is one of the greatest of all Greek cities? By day? By day? By day? Uh, the castle. The castle. Okay, you can go to, well, but my question was, oh, you, okay, why don't they go? And I didn't say it properly. Why don't they go to Alexandria? Well, yeah, there are other things. Oh, let me phrase it this way. You see what's in this photograph? There's a very nice little theater. This, by the way, is something that you can see in many cities around the Mediterranean world, and you can see it much better than what you can see here. I, I Rome, I, actually, by the way, some of the greatest of the Greek monuments are in Sicily. They're in Western Turkey, by the way. Uh, that is, there's a lot of places where you can see spectacular Greek theaters that put this to shame in terms of size and grandeur. That's not to criticize it. This is a fascinating area. But generally speaking, part of the travel business is you don't come to Egypt to see Greek monuments. You can do that somewhere else better. The one thing you can see in Egypt that you can't say anywhere else that is grander than essentially anything else are the Pharaonic monuments. So you come here. I'd stop, by the way, because this is one of the things that rather distresses me, but there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, if you look at this photograph, over on the right-hand side, you can see the little theater that everybody visits. This, by the way, is actually not really a theater. In any Greek city, this would have been called an odeon, and if you go downtown Cairo, there's actually a little cinema. 
I think it's still there. Things yeah. might have changed, but the Odeon Cinema. Odeon in a Greek city was a small neighborhood theater. It was not where you do the plays of Aeschylus or Sophocles or Eurydice. Those are done in a theater that would seat 10,000 or 15,000 people. This would seat maybe a couple of hundred people. There was a little neighborhood theater. It's an excellent example of one, but it's not one of the great theaters. In the distance, in the photograph, you might be able to see areas of red brick. That's a large public bath that dates to the second and third centuries of the Common Era. It's quite nice, but there are many better baths that survive all over the Mediterranean world. But there is something in this photograph that to me is absolutely unique. And I have been, I think, to many, if not most, of the great classical sites in the Mediterranean world by now. There's something here that's absolutely unique, and it's not just unique, it's all about what made Alexandria special. If you look at the street that goes off to the left, and the other side of the street, you're going to see a series of long rectangular buildings, one after another. Next time you go to Alexandria, if you have time and inclination to go to this site, do it, and go down and look at those little rectangular buildings. They will not be very exciting. I can't show you the slides of this, but you get to a doorway, you go inside, and there's a little vestibule, and then a wall that had an opening, a door, and it leads you into the main room, and in several of these spectacularly well-preserved are a series of and I don't quite know how to describe them. There are rows of like benches or seats that rise up and that go all the way around the hallway and come to an end. And at the end of one of them, there is still preserved spectacularly a high marble chair. These are lecture halls from the first and second centuries of the common era. These are where the great scholars, the great thinkers of ancient Alexandria would actually have met people and we know they did this, by the way, because that's how they made a living. They would give lectures and they would charge for it. And some of the greatest figures in the history of ancient science and technology could very well have lectured in these halls because the time is exactly right. In another area here, there are more lecture halls that date to the fifth century, exactly the time when the greatest female mathematician of antiquity, Hypatia, would have been living. And if you know anything about the history of Alexandria and its role in science and technology, these of their own way are holy places. They're not that exciting unless you know what's behind them. Well, unfortunately, most people don't, and so they don't go here, but they do, of course, come to see this. So which of these Egypts do you want to talk about when you say that the power of the idea of Egypt can be enormous? And the answer I'm going to give you right now is, in a real sense, none of them. That is, I'm going to be talking about an imaginary Egypt, this Egypt. Now, I think it's unlikely that any of you have ever seen this, because it's not an Egypt. This is a mosaic floor. I'm assuming you all know what mosaic is, where you use small pieces of stone and you create images, and the Greeks and the Romans were famous for this. This is a small mosaic, when I said small, that's not correct. It's actually a large mosaic floor that completely covered part of the floor of a religious shrine that dated to the end of the second century of the common era. Now, at the moment, this is set up on a wall so that visitors can see it better. It's about three meters tall to get into a sense of just how large it is. This is a huge mosaic, and it describes the Nile in flood. This is Egypt. This, by the way, is where it is. This is the town of Palestrina in Italy, which is located just outside of Rome to the southeast, where there are a series of high hills. Uh, by the way, some of you may know the name Palestrina because it's the name of one of the most famous Italian composers of the 17th, 16th and 17th centuries. He came from this town. What I'm talking about has nothing to do with him other than that, however. Because on the hillside overlooking the town, you can see the town right at the base of the photograph, there are the remains of the greatest single architectural work that survives from the early Roman period. It's a huge temple complex. You can see these ramps that go up, and they lead to an area with arcades and arches. 
And this is only a small part of this immense religious complex that the Romans built in the second century BC. But then at the very top of this structure is not an ancient building. This is a palace built by an exceptionally wealthy Italian family in the 17th century, about 300 years ago. A family, by the way, that produced several popes. It's called the Barberini family. And any of you who have spent, if any of you have any familiarity with Italy from this period, there are lots of Barberini palaces that are scattered around Italy. This is one of them. This was built around 1640. There were earlier palaces on the site built by another very wealthy family called the Colonna family. And now it houses the local museum, the National Archaeological Museum of Palestrina. Uh, it's a nicely laid out museum, but far and away its prize piece is the Nile mosaic. And what you're looking at is the entire Nile in somebody's imagination. And the imagination is somebody who would have lived in Italy in the second century BC. Somebody who was fascinated with Egypt, who may or may not have been there, who would have read or read something written by people who had been there or spoken about it, but then simply took this and created, out of their own imaginations, the reality of Egypt. For example, at the very top of the Nile Mosaic, this is Ethiopia, the land to the south, what we would call Nubia. And it's a desert area, and it's full, by the way, of people hunting. And the reason why these people are hunting is not to show them off hunting, it's to show what they're hunting. The Romans were fascinated by the animals of Egypt. And this mosaic is full of images of Egyptian animals. Some of them quite accurate, some of them just wonderfully silly. As you move literally down the mosaic, you get to Egypt in flood. The Nile is in flood. There are boats everywhere. There are little islands everywhere. People are still hunting, by the way. Over on the left, there's a hippo that has arrows in its back. And you can just barely see it off to the left. That's a crocodile. You can see its back with its tail. And the crocodile to the Romans was the quintessential animal of Egypt. And as you look through this mosaic, the mosaic has had hard times over the last 300 years. It's been taken apart and put back together several times. People who put it back together didn't know how to put the pieces together properly. There was a lot of damage. But it's a mix now of original and restored pieces, and it remains just extraordinary as somebody's image of, of Egypt that was a reflection of the reality of Egypt, but wasn't quite the real Egypt. You had villas like this in the countryside. You also have people out having a really good time in the Nile flood. Somebody has put up a bower. You have a family sitting. Uh, somebody is playing the lyre behind that. And then, well, there's, by the way, people who are working who are just sailing right by all of this. You have Alexandria which you can see down at the bottom. You can see the Greek-style columns of the temple that's shown. And you have a great Egyptian-style temple shown. And this is a time period when Egypt was being, this, 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 this mosaic would have made it the time period when the Greeks would have been ruling Egypt. These are the Ptolemies, whom you probably all have heard of. They will have been ruling Egypt for 200 years. And Greeks and Greek culture had come into Egypt in a powerful force and their presence in Egypt and jamming right up against Egyptian culture. But in this mosaic, everything is in harmony. It's a world where, well, it's, it's, it's almost a Roman's idealization of what the Egypt of this period is like. And in this Egypt, well, there are all the famous gods and goddesses. Now, this is where things will get even stranger, perhaps, than what I've just been saying. This is a painting. It's on the ceiling. Uh, it's a little bit indistinct here, but what you are looking at is a painting done at the end of the 15th century that is in the bedrooms of the Roman Pope, illustrating the life and death of the god Osiris. This is where you find it. These are called the Borgia apartments. Borgia is the name of a famous, actually quite infamous family because of the things that it did. And one of their family became Pope at the very end of the 15th century. He ordered these rooms to be repainted by the painter Tintoriccio, who's one of the great painters at the end of the 15th century. Uh, many of the paintings, you can see that at the top of the photograph, are very Christian in character, which is what you would expect in the Pope's apartments. 
But you also have, okay, part of me wants to sit here and go through a silly exercise about asking you who this is. Part of the clue, and even then I think it's hard to get, is over on, as you're looking at it, the right side of the image where you can see a bull with horns coming out. You may or may not be familiar with this term. This is the Apis bull, A-P-I-S. This is the bull who was a god of death associated with the ancient city of Memphis. And if you go to Saqqara today, and my guess is that some of you were forced to go there as little kids, and you were dragged through the place where the bulls were buried, which is called the Serapium. This is the god Apis, who is special to the god Osiris, and you're looking at Isis and Osiris. If any of you have seen Egyptian images, pharaonic images of Isis and Osiris, these don't look very Egyptian. But to the man who painted these images, and to the man, the Pope, who ordered these images to be painted, this is Isis and Osiris. And the whole cycle that's painted on the ceiling is about the life and death of Osiris. The scene down here is after Osiris' evil brother has killed Osiris. And now on the right, that's, that's Isis, who's being conveyed away in mourning. And there are many other images here. But I just wanted you to understand that what you're looking at here is a sense on the part of not Greeks and Romans of the second or first century BCE, what Egypt was like, but what people living in Italy in the 15th century, 1500 years later, thought Egypt was like. And in part, their understanding of Egypt was based on the way in which the Romans and the Greeks thought about it, because they didn't know much more about ancient Egypt than what the Greeks and the Romans had said. Now, there are other Egyptian deities wandering around in this, this wonderful environment, including a god named Thoth, T-H-O-T-H. You may or may not be familiar with him. He's a god in ancient Egypt associated with wisdom, with learning, with creation. He's also associated with two animals, the baboon and the ibis, and he's frequently shown with a human body and the head of an ibis. So there he is. Except, by the way, this is an ancient Egyptian image of him from the 12th century BCE from a tomb at Luxor. And the king of the time, Ramesses III, is giving him offerings. That's not the thought who's wandering around in the environment that we're talking about right now this increasingly imaginary Egypt. The thought that I'm talking about is, on the one hand, a version of this Egyptian god, but he's also the guy on the left. This, by the way, is from a wall painting that comes from the city of Leptis Magna in Libya. And it shows an image of a Greek god named Hermes, who is the same god whom the Romans called Mercury, who is a god who is associated with very rarely wisdom, but he's associated with passing on information, with conveying information. And when the Greeks came to Egypt, they encountered this vast number of gods. And they wanted to make sense out of all of this, so they wanted to know which gods were the same as their gods, or which gods were responsible for the same things. And so one of the problems that many people encounter in understanding Egyptian gods is that nowadays we have to deal not only with the Egyptian name of the god, but with the Greek name that the gods gave. Well, the Greeks called this god on the left Hermes, and so they called the god on the right Hermes. That is, for the Greeks, this was Hermes, who happened to be the same as the god of the Egyptians. Okay, so what? This is so what? And this is, by the way, where things get a little bit more complicated and a little bit talkier, I'm afraid. There's Thoth on the left. There's Mercury, or Hermes, on the right. Together, they become the guy in the center. Hermes Trismegistus. Trismegistus is a word that means the three times, the three times great person. In other words, the spectacularly important person. This is... Whoever he is, this is a person who now passes down as a figure of overwhelming significance. The three times great Hermes. The reason he's three times great is that he is Egyptian. He lived long before the time of the Greeks and the Romans. He is the same as their god Hermes, so they're going to call him Hermes. 
but he lived thousands of years before the time of the Greeks, the Romans, the Phoenicians, the Persians, the Hebrews, you name it. Long, for example, before the time that the Bible was even written down. And what Hermes did was to write, in Egyptian, a series of texts that explained everything. Who God was. For the most part, by the way, Hermes says there's only one God. Who may manifest himself in a number of different ways, but ultimately God is a single overarching force. And that God is present in nature to the point where nature is God. And the reality of life itself, which is a gift of God, is in everything. Everything that exists, whether it is animate or inanimate, actually has some aspect of the power of God, of the life infused in it by God. And if you understand these writings of the God thought, Hermes, Hermes the Great, you understand everything. This is why this guy was so important. Now, his works were written down in Egyptian eons ago. But in the time of the Greeks and the Romans, they were supposed to have been translated into Greek. And they only survived in Greek, but they are now the record of the wisdom of the ancient Egyptians. A wisdom that goes back thousands of years before the time of any of the other great peoples of the ancient world. A wisdom that is closer to the source of all wisdom, God, than anything written by anybody else since. That was the idea. These are the surviving aspects of that wisdom. They have been translated into English. According to texts from the Roman period, there were some 42 treatises, individual texts, that this Hermes had written down that had been translated. There are, by the way, today some 19 or 20 of them that survive. That's the idea. And you could go into almost any bookstore in the world, and you will probably find translations or copies of these. And I don't mean that as a joke, by the way, because in the 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries, these documents in Greek were all translated into Arabic. And they were all very well known. The author of these documents came to be identified with one or more of the prophets in the Holy Quran. And Hermes himself, according to Arab writers, was buried inside the pyramids. That's why they were built as tombs for Hermes. So, these books, they're called the Hermetica or the Corpus Hermeticum. That means the writings of Hermes, basically. These still exist. But they exist because of the story that I need now to finish up. By the way, before I go any further, here are the titles of some of the 18 treatises that survive. Poimandis, the shepherd of men, to Asclepius, the sacred sermon, the cupper monad, though unmanifest, God is most manifest. I don't know if that means anything to you, but the idea basically is you may not be able to see God, but God is manifest, God is present in everything. The fact that you don't necessarily see a physical God has nothing to do with reality. It's what lies behind reality in terms of what you can see that matters. And God alone is good, and elsewhere, nowhere. The greatest ill among men is ignorance of God. That no one of existing things doth perish, but men in error speak of their changes as destruction and as deaths. Now, there are other titles as well, but even if you don't know very much about this, and takes, these books are very complex to read, some of the idea of what they're about comes through in some of the titles, the sense of the greatness of God, the need to understand God, the fact that the way most people understand the world is wrong, and you need to understand it properly. And if you read these books properly, you will understand. You will understand because this is the wisdom of the ancient Egyptians themselves. Except, modern Egyptologists boring as they are, have spent decades and decades locating and translating the works of the ancient Egyptians. They had to learn hieroglyphs to do this. And nobody's ever found any of these writings in Egyptian. Nobody's ever found anything that even sounds like most of what is in these writings. Now, there are some interesting things. For example, 
In the third and second centuries BC, there were a couple of very popular tales that were told in Egypt about a great hero of the past. The hero's name was Hyamwas. There was a short form of his name called Setne. And if you're an Egyptologist, you have to read the Setne stories. There are three of them. They're fascinating tales. But they come from the very end of the Egyptian tradition. And the hero of these tales, and please forgive me now because I'm now stepping out of my line of thought for a moment. You see the name Hyamwas. This is short for Hyamwas. When you read the text, it's very plain who Hyamwas it is. This is the fourth son of King Ramesses the Great who lived a thousand years before the time these tales are written down. Now what's interesting about this is, okay, I don't know what you know in detail about Ramesses the Great, but everybody at one time or another learns that he lived forever, he built endless numbers of things, he had lots of wives, and so he had lots of children. He's supposed to have had at least about 50 legitimate sons. He outlived 13 of them. Each of them was the heir and then died off. And this Hiawasset that we're talking about was the fourth heir, and he died off long before his father. A thousand years later, this fourth son of Ramesses the Great is the greatest magician of all, the hero of one of the few great surviving tales of this kind that we have in ancient Egyptian, and his father Ramesses doesn't even show up at all. This time must have been something special in his own day, to be, begin a legend that would continue for a thousand years to the point where, at least in the way in which he was remembered, he's far greater than Ramesses the Great. Today we get obsessed about Ramesses the Great because we see the buildings. There's other ways you can understand the past. Well, what's interesting about this is that the first Setne story is about his search for the Book of Thoth. Remember Thoth? And he's part of Hermes Trismegistus. Here's what the story says. An elderly priest said, if you desire to read writings, come to me, and I will have you taken to the place where that book is that Thoth wrote with his own hand when he came down following the other gods. Two spells are written in it. When you recite the first spell, you will charm the sky, the earth, the netherworld, the mountains, and the waters. You will discover what all the birds of the sky and all the reptiles are saying. You will see the fish of the deep, even though there are 21 cubits of water between you and them. And then when you recite the second spell, it will happen that wherever you are, whether down in the underworld or here on earth, you will see the sun god himself. Which, by the way, means that if you really want to control everything on the earth, you need to find the Book of Thoth. Keep that in mind, by the way. If any of you are taking classes or you're having problems with them or you're looking for a better job or whatever, find the Book of Thoth because that will give you control over everything. And the non-joke about this is people today are still looking for the Book of Thoth. But others say, no, we have the Book of Thoth because we have the, the writings of Hermes. He's Thoth. The problem is that what is talked about here has very little to do with what's in the writings of Hermes. <clears throat> there is magic in those writings, but it's not of the kind of thing that's talked about here. That is, it's very hard here to see an ancient Egyptian forebear for the idea of Hermes that I'm talking about. So the Hermes that I'm talking about, well, he lived eons ago before the age of the Greeks and the Romans and the Persians and the Hebrews. He wrote about the truth concerning the divine, the universe, and everything else. And who preserved his writings? The priests of ancient Egypt. This was their special knowledge. And what this means is that by the end of antiquity, the 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries AD, the idea that the ancient Egyptian that had a special knowledge of everything was alive and well, and the idea was that they were in these texts, written by Hermes Trismegistus. In translation, however, not in the original Egyptian, apparently that was lost, but rather in Greek. And they continued to be known throughout the Middle Ages. Not all of them. This, for example, is, now some of you may know what I'm about to talk about. In the late, in the 1940s, there was a discovery made at Naga Hamadi in Upper Egypt. Uh, this is a town south of Soha that included a large cache of papyrus documents, many of which are among the oldest Christian documents that survived. And if any, anybody interested in early Christian history, they're extraordinarily important. But among them 
were three texts that were very similar to the writings of Hermes. Now, these documents are written down in the 4th and 5th centuries. So that means that in the 4th and 5th centuries AD, at the end of antiquity, these documents were certainly circulating in Egypt. We know they were circulating throughout the rest of the Roman world. And some of them survived into the Middle Ages into Europe, and especially the Arab world. This is a translation of one of the Hermetic texts into Arabic. Actually, by the way, this is a copy of a translation done much earlier. This dates to the 14th century. But in Europe, they had only one of the texts, and it wasn't a very good copy. They knew that Hermes was this great source of wisdom, because some of the Greek writers whose texts they did have said that. And they had one text that gave them some sense of what this Hermes was. But other than that, they really didn't know very much about Hermes. They didn't know very much about ancient Egypt. Very few Europeans had ever been to Egypt. Or they had very rarely traveled outside of Alexandria. And then, in the year 1460, let me stop right here. Uh, the date may not seem important to you, but to anybody who studies European history, it's enormously important. You're now entering not just the Renaissance, you're entering the period of what's called the High Renaissance. It's about 1460 that Leonardo da Vinci is born. 20 and 30 years after this, Michelangelo is born. All of the great art that one associates with the highest period of the Renaissance is about to be produced, and there's been a century and more of great <coughs> art, and together with that, all kinds of new thinking and speculation about the world. Now, you've probably studied the Renaissance to one degree or another in class. Okay, in 1460, a monk who was sponsored by the ruler of the city of Florence in Italy, and who traveled in Eastern Europe and into Greece, visiting monasteries and looking for ancient <clears throat> manuscripts, returned to the city of Florence with a complete copy of the writings of Hermes Trismegistus. We don't know exactly where he got it from. It would have been a monastery probably in Eastern Europe or Greece, but that's about the best that we can say. But it wasn't all 42 treatises, if that's correct. But the 18 treatises that we have today, this is where they come from. And they had an immediate and powerful impact on the world around them, partly because of this guy. Now, I doubt any of you know about him, possibly one or two of you do. Uh, you'd have to be a real specialist in the history of medieval thought in Europe, and especially in the thought of the Renaissance. But this is one of the greatest and most influential philosophers in the European tradition. He was an Italian. He lived his life in Florence, Italy, at the height of Florence, the great city of art and culture at the height of the Renaissance. His name was Marsilio Ficino. He was a great scholar. He was an astrologer. And to be an astrologer in these days meant that you were the greatest astronomer at the time. He was a courtier at the service of Cosimo de' Medici, one of the great rulers of the Renaissance. He was a great translator of Plato, of Plotinus, and of other classical philosophers. He was the founder of the Florentine Academy, which was a gathering of the greatest minds of the day that had enormous influence in Italy and then in Europe in the century to follow. And when the writings of Hermes Trismegistus arrived in Florence in 1460, they were given to Cosimo de' Medici, the ruler, who immediately gave them to this guy, he spent the next three years translating them into Latin, at which point they were published and they spread all over Europe. This, by the way, is a portrait of him produced by a contemporary named Jürgen Dial. And the reason why I'm talking about all of this is something that I'm not going to go into great lengths about right now. I'm just going to summarize this quickly. Renaissance philosophy that is, the high intellectual thought of the Renaissance that developed at this time, had very distinctive characteristics. Renaissance philosophy was determined to break out of the narrow range of approved books, books about logic, about reasoning, about how to think, that had been approved by the Roman Catholic Church. Most of these books, by the way, were ancient authority, like Aristotle, whom I'm sure you've all heard of. But Europe knew very little about Plato at this time or about many of the other great writers of the Greek tradition. And these writers and original works of Greek began to come into Italy at this time. They were translated. And as these new works became available, 
Well, they opened up a host of new ways of thinking about the human condition, the nature of the divine, the relationship between God and nature, as well as about the relationship between God, humankind, and the church. And I'm putting a great deal of emphasis on the church, because in Europe, in the 15th century, in the heart of the Renaissance, the church still claimed absolute authority over its believers, in the sense that the only way to understand what God expects of you is to go to the church to find out. In fact, in this period, there were even restrictions on who was allowed to read the Bible. Because if people read the Bible, they might misunderstand. They might misunderstand the fact, by the way, that they're supposed to go to the church to find out how to understand the Bible. And I know I said that in a way that's slighting, but there is a degree to which that's true. All of these new, new works from the past, Plato, Plotinus, other great thinkers from classical antiquity, forced a radical rethinking of everything, including Christianity. And when I say that, I don't mean that it forced people to start denying Christianity. Most of these people were firmly believing Christians, but they had a problem. It was the way in which they were being forced to understand Christianity, and in particular, who it was who was forcing them to understand it in a particular way, the church. And this is where the Hermetic texts become critical. There have been an endless number of books written about this. When I say endless, there's about 15 of them. They're superb works of scholarship. And they're focused on the way in which all over Europe, in the 16th century, writers, intellectuals, read the Hermetic text, and they saw this not just as a new source of ancient wisdom, and they took this as equivalent to Plato and Aristotle and everything else. And even better, because this is a text that sought to even more directly address the nature of God than did Plato, for example in a way that most of them found consistent with the basic understanding of Christianity, even if the church might not agree. And then there was something else to add to this, and that's part of why I'm doing this whole bit. It was validated by its source. Its source was Egypt. The world's oldest culture, with the world's oldest religion, with the world's oldest spiritual understanding, with the world's oldest religious text, which is what the Hermetic texts were believed to be, <clears throat> the fact that these texts validate these new ways of understanding was immensely significant. The very fact that they had the idea of Egypt behind them, I, I mean, again, people in 15th century Italy really didn't know very much about the realities of ancient Egypt or even modern Egypt. But what they knew was that the Greeks and the Romans thought that ancient Egypt was a place of overwhelming significance and a source of great knowledge. And if the Greeks and the Romans believed this, well, that was part of the validation. And you understand what I mean by validation? Uh, let me phrase it in a different way. If the issue is, how do you understand what God expects of you? And if the Roman Catholic Church says, you have to come to us to find out, because only we can understand the Bible, <clears throat> And you now read the Hermetic texts, which are thousands of years older than the written Bible, and they give you now a direct way to understand God and validate your own understanding of the Bible. This is really something. As I will say in a moment, it's also potentially really dangerous. This is really important stuff, because what you're doing is undermining the authority of the Roman Catholic Church, which is a key aspect of understanding all of European history in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, in political terms, in cultural terms, in religious terms. Part of all of this, through very complicated ways, leads to figures who are become important in the Reformation. And if you don't know very much about European or Christian history, in the 16th century, a whole new movement developed within the body of European Christianity that was built around denying the authority of Rome. It ended up being immensely divisive, huge, desperate wars were fought over this, but much of this is critical to understanding how Europe developed and went in its own unique direction in the 16th and 17th centuries. Other aspects become tied into this. The writings of Hermes, 
emphasize the importance of everything in nature is infused with a sensibility by God himself. Which means if you understand this properly, you should be able to learn how to influence or control all of these things. And that led to a lot of directions, including what we think of as being magic, which had always been there. But this is now a much more organized way of thinking about magic. But it also encourages you to study nature even more intensely for the purpose of understanding how things happen. And there have been a number of major works done by scholars who point out that hermetic thinkers, when I say hermetic, I mean Europeans in the 16th century were influenced by the hermetic writings, how they become critical in the beginnings of the scientific revolution of the 17th century. Now that's not to say that Hermes Trismegistus is the source of all of this, or that Egypt is responsible for all of this, what I am saying is that it's actually extraordinary when you realize that Egypt had a role in all of this. And the fact that it validated this process. Hermes Trismegistus came to be recognized as the first and one of the greatest of all natural philosophers. And it had another impact, because it created a whole new wave of interest in finding out more about Egypt. There were, by the way, lots of Egyptian things around Europe, but most of them were objects created by Greeks and Romans, where they were fascinated by Egypt, so they kind of put Egyptian idioms into a tabletop or something like this. This, by the way, is in the Egyptian Museum in Turin. It's called the Isis Table, or the Mensa Isieka. It's full of these Egyptian images, showing them in religious context that have no parallel in ancient Egypt, even though the images are Egyptian ones. This was something that was produced probably in Italy or in Sicily, probably in the first century BC. And it's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about that now, now they were looking for this because this would give them more of an insight to ancient Egypt. This is another tabletop. This is in the National Museum in Rome, and I love this one, by the way. But this has inlay, a different colored stone that's placed into the tabletop. And you have these wonderful Egyptian images that are actually not Pharaonic in style at all. They're inspired by it, but when you look at them carefully, the faces are different, the shape posing of the bodies are different. This is a, an imaginary Roman's conception of an Egyptian thing. And it went beyond this. For example, you now begin to get travelers going to Egypt who wanted to visit the monuments. Still small in number because it was difficult to do, but you begin to get now over the next century to have more reports coming back about the real Egypt. And there was now increased attention paid to the few real Egyptian objects that were in Italy at this time. <clears throat> For example, the Romans had had a fascination with ancient Egypt, and they expressed that by ripping off obelisks from Egypt and carrying them back to Italy. And again, I don't know if any of you have the chance to go to Rome, and I hope you all do someday, because it's an extraordinary city. But you go from one great plaza in front of a famous church to another great plaza in front of a famous church to another plaza in front of a famous church, and every one of these plazas has an obelisk in front of it. The obelisks were there before there was Christianity. The Romans had brought them in, but they're there in the plazas because people, okay, this is in front of the, the one on the left, the great church of Santa Maria Maggiore in, in, in Rome, one of the largest of all the churches. The one on the right is in St. Peter's Square. The one on the right, by the way, was for all practical purpose the tallest building in Europe at the time that, well, at the time that they were writing about all of this. There might have actually been one or two castles that had few higher towers, but that would have been about it. These were the people at the time, the skyscrapers of the day. They were just extraordinary monuments, plus they were covered with all of this weird stuff which nobody understood. And that's important for this reason. Remember I was talking about how Renaissance philosophy led to a radical rethinking of many things, particularly the role of the church, and I made the comment that this was potentially a very dangerous thing to do. It wasn't just potentially dangerous. There is a beautiful plaza in the middle of the old part of Rome, it's beautiful, frankly, because every day there's a, court, there's a large popular market and there are tents up all over the place and they sell flowers and this and that or whatever. It's called the Campo di Fiore, the field of flowers. And every evening they clear everything away 
And what's left in the middle of this wonderful plaza is this brooding statue of a guy wearing a hood. His name is Giordano Bruno. He was one of the great scholars of the 16th century, a great believer in the wisdom of Hermes. Uh, he also is somebody who is regarded as, not himself, by the way, in the scientific tradition, but one of those who was pressing others to move that way. He's one of the great figures of the 16th century, and in the year 1600, he was burned to death at the stake in the middle of the square on the side of the statue because he had developed different ideas about the nature of Christ than the church favored, and this is how they dealt with the problem. I'm not just saying, by the way, that it was potentially dangerous. These ideas were really dangerous, but fortunately, the ancient Egyptians had a way to solve that, too. In 1419, a book entitled On Hieroglyphics was discovered in a monastery on an island in the Aegean Sea, the island of Andros. The book was written in Greek. And the manuscript was brought to Florence, where it still is. It's a book that is supposed to have been written by a man named Hor Apollo. Now, think about that for a moment. Hor, probably you would recognize the ancient Egyptian word Horus. Apollo, that's a Greek word. That's a Greek word for the sun god. His name is Hor Apollo. In his name, there's an Egyptian element and a Greek element, which is, by the way, quite common by the third, fourth, and fifth centuries of the common era in Egypt. So, here you have this text on hieroglyphs written by a man named Hor Apollo, and it so happens that there is an encyclopedia that survives from the Middle Ages. It was composed probably in Constantinople, modern Istanbul, probably around the year 1000 of the common era, and it names two Hor Apollos. And they're both based in Egypt, and they both live around about the year 400 to 500 of the common era. That is at the very end of antiquity. Now there's, there are two interesting things about this. We don't know which of these two guys is the Horopolo who wrote the book. We just have no evidence. Chances are it was one of them. Probably the grammarian, the one that's mentioned at the bottom of the text. But it doesn't really matter. There is absolute agreement that this was an Egyptian who, by the way, had been fluent in Greek and in Egyptian, writing in the 5th century, telling you what hieroglyphs are and how they work. And this is 1,500 years before Champollion, which makes you wonder why Champollion didn't just read the book to find out how hieroglyphs work, because the book had been in Europe for 400 years by the time of Champollion. Well, I'll explain the reasons for that. Hor Apollo lived in the 5th century. And I said there are two things about him that are interesting. One is who he was, or might have been, Second is this, in the, by the 5th century AD, the best evidence we have is that the last person who could really read and write hieroglyphs had probably died two, century, or two centuries earlier. By about 300 in the common era, hieroglyphs had simply ceased to be used in Egypt to write down the Egyptian language. Egyptians had finally come to terms with the presence of the Greek alphabet in Egypt and realized that writing down a language in an alphabet of 24 symbols is ultimately a lot easier to learn how to do than trying to write a system that's based on thousands of picture images. And by the way, everywhere around the Mediterranean world where peoples had a picture writing system and then they encountered an alphabet, they ultimately adopted the alphabet. It's simply a matter of facility. It's just much easier. And the Egyptians did that. It was a long period of transition, but by 300 AD, there's probably nobody left in Egypt who can really read and write hieroglyphs. There are temple walls in Egypt that were decorated with hieroglyphs in the 4th and 5th centuries. If you try to read them, they're gibberish. Because whoever decorated them simply went to an older wall, copied down images, and then threw them off. Because it's not that people couldn't read or write Egyptian. They just shifted to a different script. And nobody was now going to the trouble to learn the old script. Which is why this guy, in the 5th century AD, wanted to write down a book to tell you how to use the old script. Problem is, most modern Egyptologists would say that he didn't know how to do it. So he made up an answer. Okay, these are hieroglyphs from his book. They, by the way, if you know hieroglyphs, may not look like pharaonic hieroglyphs, but they're picture images. 
Because what he argued is the writing system of the ancient Egyptians was a code built out of symbols. Each symbol is a picture. So if you know the meaning of each symbol, you know the meaning of the code. All you need is a key to the code. That is a key that will tell you what this symbol means. For example, in one hieroglyphic system, the picture of the bird that's right there might mean one thing, and another it might mean something else. How are you going to know which it is? You have to have the key. But if you've learned the key, you know the code. And when this idea, remember, War Apollo comes to in Europe in the 15th century, the idea that hieroglyphs were an entirely symbolic writing system, that caught like wildfire among intellectuals in Europe. And they picked up the idea. This, by the way, is by an intellectual of the sort, Albrecht Fuhrer, one of the great painters of the 16th century, who wrote a, a number of hieroglyphs. And all he was doing is sketching out things saying, this symbolizes something else. Uh, by the way, anybody guess what the symbol is on the bottom right-hand side? The worm that's swallowing itself? Infinity. Infinity. Because it just goes on forever. Uh, by the way, that's assuming that that's the right key. But it is one of the interpretations. Ficino, the philosopher I talked about, said, this will be the golden age when all words, figure words, myths and all figures, language figures, will be hybrid. Erasmus, and that's a name some of you might have heard of, he's a great philosopher of the early 16th century. Hieroglyphs are symbols by means of which it was and is possible to express the true significance of things. Which brings me back to my man, Valeriano, and the book that I started out with. Valeriano was born about 1475 in Italy. He was born poor, but he was very smart and recognized as such, so he was given an education. He ended up becoming associated with the great scholars in Florence, which was the great center of scholarship at the end of the 15th and 16th centuries. He did take holy orders in 1523, and he devoted the rest of his life to scholarship in Florence and in cities around Florence. He wrote two famous books, one of which, as far as I know, nobody reads. That's On the Misfortunes of Learned Men. It's basically it's basically a long treatise about how you don't want to waste your time becoming too educated because look at all these famous learned men of antiquity who ended up dying badly. The second one, though, is the book on hieroglyphs that I was talking about, which may not be written much now, but it was very important in its day. And when you look at it, the chapter headings are simply a long list, and they're lists of images. And I apologize for the quality of the photographs. This is the best that I could do in the library. But you can see the chapter headings, and then after that, it lists, actually what it does is it lists a certain type of image and how you can use it in different ways. Valeriano wrote, to speak hieroglyphically is nothing else but to discern the true nature of things divine and human. Another way to put that is, Hermes Trismegistus has told you that, but now you can encode this wisdom in hieroglyphs. The ancient Egyptians did that. Here's the thing. This book was not about how to understand ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. It's how you could write your own hieroglyphs. And why would you want to do that? Let's say you've written a very complicated and potentially dangerous tract. All right, translate it into code. Send it to somebody in the Netherlands or into England. And even if it's stopped along the way by somebody whom you don't want to have seen it, they don't have the key, so they can't understand it. This becomes a way that you can pass on secret and dangerous knowledge. Which, by the way, is exactly what the priests of ancient Egypt did. They kept all of that wisdom secret, and they passed it on from one generation of priests to the next using hieroglyphs. So, for example, what Valeriano did today is take the lion. The lion is a symbol of nobleness, of mind, and majesty. You can show it as a symbol of ferocity when it's represented roaring. So here he's got a roaring lion. It could be a nurturer and protector. And here's the lion sitting down with a lamb. And by the way, the importance is you've got to put the lion with the lamb. Otherwise, the symbol doesn't make any sense. Or the lion could be a symbol of strength and mind when you yoke it together with another powerful animal. Or the elephant. Now, by the way, they knew very little about elephants in Italy. But that's OK. They had read in ancient books about elephants. 
So the elephant is a symbol of purity because it bathes at night in the full moon, which is what some Roman authors had said. It could be a symbol of gentleness when represented peacefully among young lambs. You see the role of lambs in all of this. Put a lamb together with a ferocious beast, you've now got a very useful code meaning. And then you can take these symbols and all of them another way. And remember, this is a Christian period and he's writing for a Christian audience. So there is a lion that symbolizes power, and on its back is a young figure with the burst of the sun. Now, by the way, this is not Apollo, the sun god, the great god. And in philosophy, often the great god was represented by the sun, is God himself, the only god, the one true god. Now, of course, in Christianity, there is the issue of the tripart nature of God, which I am not going to go into right now. But here is God as Jesus riding the lion, which becomes a symbol in of itself of any number of aspects of power. So, by 1600 of the Common Era, by the end of the Renaissance, Renaissance and European intellectuals have produced a well-developed Egyptology, an understanding of Egypt, marked by, one, a general fascination with things Egyptian, like obelisks, works of art, and so on, two, an understanding of the high wisdom of the ancient Egyptians, built around the conception of an all-powerful god that was developed, maintained, and passed on by the priests of ancient Egypt and was present in the Hermetic texts, and finally, an understanding of the way in which the ancient Egyptian priesthood had preserved their high wisdom in a complex code based on symbolic energy. Here's everything you need to know about ancient Egypt. You are now an Egyptologist. Except, in the early 17th century, this man, Athanasius Kircher, a great scholar, and several others, went back and looked again at the Hermetic texts. And they studied them carefully, they compared them with Christian texts, with philosophical texts, and they began to notice a whole series of things that suggested to them that these could not possibly have been written, have been written by the ancient Egyptians. They found whole phrases that were just lifted from other ancient writers, and they came to the conclusion that these were legitimate texts of the second, third, and fourth centuries of the Common Era, but that's when they were composed, and they were composed in Greek, not Egyptian. And what they really represented were aspects of the philosophical thinking that you would have found all around the Mediterranean world at this time, including in Egypt. That is, they proved to the satisfaction of almost everyone that these were not ancient Egyptian texts, and this was not ancient Egyptian knowledge. And you might think at that point that this whole Egyptology would come crashing down. No, it didn't. Its first, this was Europe's first encounter with ancient Egypt. It had profound consequences that we've talked about, and it created a vision of ancient Egypt as a center of ancient and esoteric wisdom, of ancient knowledge that persists to this day. I don't know if any of you have seen the opera of the Magic Flute. Uh, my guess is that many of you have not, a few of you have. This is one of the most famous of all operas produced in Europe. The opera was written about 1792 and 1793. This is five years before Napoleon came to Egypt with his expedition and the famous scientists he brought with him. This is still a time period when Europeans know very little of what we would call the reality of Egypt. But they didn't need that because they had their own Egyptology. And if you ever had the chance to see the magic flute, it is full of this understanding of ancient Egypt that is what I've just been talking about. It starts out with a prince who's fleeing a dragon in the Nile Valley, and he's saved from this by a series of figures that have magic. But he then gets involved in the struggle in the Nile Valley between a kind of priesthood with advanced wisdom and evildoers who are trying to tear it down, and he begins to get together with those who are trying to defend the good. Turns out, by the way, they have ancient wisdom, much of it derived directly from the Holy Hermes and Isis and figures of ancient Egypt. And whenever you see the magic flute done, most of the time the sets, in one way or another, even if obliquely, like down to the bottom right, are going to have Egyptian themes. In fact, in many ways, if you were going to produce an opera out of the pyramids, it should not be Aida, it should be this one. Because at the very end of the opera, our hero and then his wife have to undergo a trial by fire and water. They have to walk through a fiery room and through a water, then through a room filled with water. And those rooms are in the pyramids in Egypt. 
because that's what the pyramids were. They were sacred initiation halls for the adherents of the ancient wisdom. Now, within 10 years of the writing of the magic flute, all of this was going to begin to change because of those scholars of Napoleon brought with him. And they would begin to create the Egyptology that we have today. But you're left with this. All of the stuff that I was talking about, the Egyptology of Hermes and so on and so on, all of this was built upon a conception of ancient Egypt that, that professional Egyptologists would argue was a complete falsehood. The Hermetic texts were not translations of ancient Egyptian texts, written thousands of years before the time of the Greeks. They were written in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th centuries in Greek. They were probably very little influenced, if at all, by ancient Egypt. And the understanding of hieroglyphs as a means of conveying information secretly through coded symbols, well, that was wrong too. We now know that because of Champollion. And yet, if you think that ancient Egypt that I've been talking about is dead, go onto the internet, type in Hermetic, and you're going to find thousands of websites that are dedicated to the fact that these Hermetic texts actually are the wisdom of ancient Egypt. And they will bring it up to date. You can find, by the way, a whole text on green hermeticism, justifying going green by looking at the hermetic text. Uh, hermetic astrology still exists and is far superior to understanding things in modern astronomy. And inevitably, by the way, it comes back to the source. And this understanding of ancient Egypt as a repository of secret wisdom and knowledge, in many ways that lies behind all of the stuff I was talking about at the beginning, the belief that well, whoever built the pyramids had to have a special wisdom, a special knowledge, a special technology. I find it distressing that most people who argue that, therefore say it couldn't have been the Egyptians who built the pyramids. It had to be somebody else. Think about that for a moment, by the way. Whenever you do read or hear about all of these speculations about flying saucer people or ancient civilizations with high technologies and so on and so on building the pyramids, Whoever is proposing these ideas are basically saying that the people who said they built the pyramids, that is the ancient Egyptians, who said they built them as tombs for their kings, that they didn't really build them and they didn't know what they were talking about. Now, maybe that's true. But on the other hand, I, the question that really I end up with, and I, this is my last slide, I'm stopping here, and I have gone way over my time, although I did warn them it might take me about an hour and 15 minutes to do this, so I apologize. What I'm fascinated by is this question. Why has ancient Egypt, alone among almost all of the other great ancient civilizations, exerted such a profound influence on peoples of completely different cultural and historical background? To the point where ancient Egypt had a decisive impact on the development of modern thought in Europe, even on the development of the modern scientific tradition. Maybe not a big impact, but a decisive one, one that mattered. Why does ancient Egypt still exert such a profound influence on peoples of completely different cultural and historical backgrounds? But why do so many of these peoples strip ancient Egypt of its historical and cultural context? Why did they insist on reinterpreting it and transforming it into something that probably never existed? I have a lot of answers to this, but I'm actually not going to provide those right now. I'd like you to think about all of this, because to me, this is one of the most fascinating things about this country and its heritage. That is, there is something about Egypt that has a profound impact on those who encounter it, unlike that of almost any other country in the world. Maybe today it's not quite the same, although if you look at tourists coming to Egypt because they want to see these things from the Quranic past, I think it is still a lot. If you look at the internet and the endless speculation about Egypt in terms of aliens this or ancient technologies that or whatever, that too to me suggests that there is something unique about Egypt. And then, the Egypt that is unique is only one of the historical Egypts. It's not forever Roman Egypt. I, by the way, am a specialist in that period, and I would very quickly make the argument that Greco-Roman Egypt produced more that shaped the world and created the world that exists today than ancient Egypt ever did. Most people would find that strange, however, because ancient Egypt is the source of everything. 
Well, we think that a lot of it has to do with what I've just been talking about and what I'm now asking about. Why is it that it's ancient Egypt that has this special place? And I'd like you to think about that. I mean, I can suggest answers, but this is one of those things that I think is one of the most fascinating things about this country. And I will stop there. Um, we are, we have the whole room until 8 o'clock and beyond. You must be dead because I've been talking so long. And I am a stunningly boring speaker, so I don't know why all of you have been so kind to stay here, but I'm really very grateful. But if anybody of you have any questions, or if anybody has some speculations about why ancient Egypt has this impact, I really would like to hear it. Thank you. I got another tag on. And if you don't have any questions, it's been 90 minutes, so please don't feel embarrassed about anything. Uh, but I, I don't know if anybody. Uh, I didn't uh, look at the medical uh, book or this uh, books or something inside, but uh, I, I was a bit surprised that it has had <coughs> such an influence uh, what is inside or something because I suppose the, the word uh, mythic, uh, uh, something is in French, uh, mythic is something possible to understand essentially. So the content of this book is it something? About which book are you talking about? Yeah. Hermes or the hieroglyphs? No, the Hermeticum, the book okay. that has been published, the republish, and yeah. uh, still some people reading it apparently. But, uh, I mean, you said that it has an enormous influence, but maybe the influence was just the belief that something was in it, which is a revealing thing. But was it understandable or was it inside? Because uh, Hermetic is supposed to be something uh, very hard for Okay, to... again, I'm, I'm, you're talking about the Hermes books or the book on hieroglyphs, which was the one no, that. The, well, when the Hermetico, the, the book that you call Hermetica or Hermetico or something. Uh, Hieroglyphica. No. no. See, I'm getting confused with no. me. Hermetico. If you remember, Hieroglyphs is the one that translated the, the, the Hieroglyphs were a cult. You're not talking no, about No, 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 no. Okay. The other one that was supposed to reveal the. Well, the other one, by the way, they read and understood. They were able to do this because it was in Greek translated into Latin and is spread all over Europe in Latin. And every great intellectual period could read Latin fluently. And what they were reading to them was very familiar because it had many things that were consonant with what they knew about the Bible, especially the New Testament, and what they knew from Plato, from Plotinus, and other great classical philosophers. Nowadays, modern scholars would say, well, but of course, because whoever wrote these just lifted from all of these sources. But to 15th and century, 15th and 16th century scholars, they didn't have vast bodies of material to review. What they had, they were just beginning to receive things, and now they get this stuff that's all laid out very clearly. And to them, it is immensely understandable and very impressive, and it validates Plato, it validates Plotinus, it validates all of these other figures. Okay, sorry to interrupt, it's just because probably I was confused about the word, at least in French, hermetic means something impossible to understand. Oh, okay. Hermetic means that, so I thought it was coming from... By, by the way, actually, I'm sorry, then, uh, and let me make this point, and I'm making a presumption, by the way, that most of you are not native speakers of English, and I don't mean that negatively, it's just to explain something. The word hermetic, I use that in a context where it meant a certain set of books that were written by Hermes Trismegistus. But the word itself, in English and in most European languages, has moved out of that context to describe ways of thinking about things that are, and the most common English word that's used may not help any, esoteric. Something that is outside of the norm. Something that is different and unexpected. And it can also mean something that is weird or beyond belief. So that the term hermetic, when I was a little kid growing up and encountered it for the first time, I didn't know it had anything to do with the Greek god Hermes. I understood the context of texts that are hermetic represent very strange ways of thinking about things. That was the context that I learned about. Now, it comes out of this idea that you had these hermetic texts, and then they turned out to be forgeries. They turned out to be false, unless, of course, you don't believe that they are false. But it extended beyond that into ways of thinking that were outside of the mainstream. 
And this is the point where I wanted to do basically about another 90 minute lecture, and I will spare you that. But, okay, who are the Templars? Templars? Anybody here know that term? Which, by the way, if you don't, is a good thing because it means you don't watch the History 2 channel regularly on OSN or any of Okay, the Templars were a group of European, it's a weird thing, they were warrior knights, uh, oh, excuse me, warrior monks who were involved with the Crusades. And they were supposed to be great warriors, and at a certain moment they went back to Europe. They were extremely wealthy, and the standard story is that the king of France got together with the Pope to destroy them to get their money. And they were wiped out in the 14th century. But if you watch endless television documentaries that seem never to stop and read tons of books, the Templars are part of a tradition that is thousands of years old that goes back to ancient Egypt, of course. They began as defenders of ancient knowledge. They became associated with the builders of ancient Egypt. The builders of ancient Egypt had a special knowledge. They were the ones who could build pyramids. And as people say, we don't even know how to build pyramids nowadays, which by the way is nonsense. We could easily build a pyramid if we wanted to spend many billions of Egyptian pounds building a pyramid. The question is, why would anybody want to waste money on building a pyramid nowadays? That, that's an object that had something to do with its own time. Now, I don't need to be too funny about that. What I am saying is that there is this idea that you must have heard of that, that the ancient Egyptians possessed a special technology, a special knowledge about building. And they passed on those secrets to a small select group of people who then traveled to other cultures and civilizations and carried their knowledge about architecture and art with them. And they've done this over the millennia and they passed from one place to another. And in the 17th and 18th centuries, they became slightly above ground and called themselves the Freemasons. Now, you may or may not have heard of the Masons or the Freemasons. This is an order that many think developed in, it, it's an esoteric order, a kind of secret order that has its own special beliefs, beliefs and understandings that developed in the 17th century. But others say, no, no, this goes all the way back to ancient Egypt. And these secret builders are still with us today. And they still have great influence and great power and so on and so on and so on. And they're all tied up with Hermeticism. And the rights of the Freemasons have the hermetic aspects associated with them. And I think all of these things come together, and this is where the word hermetic moves out of the mainstream of philosophical understanding into a kind of, I don't want to use the word weird, because if you're involved with this, it's anything but weird. But to those who are not involved with it, it's not part of the mainstream. So the word hermetic in English doesn't mean transparent, really. Yeah. It means impossible to understand. It's sort of coded in a way. It's sort of coded in a way. Okay. I mean, By the way, I, I still think it comes from the same source. It's just carrying it to the extreme. Sure, sure. Uh, you have to, by the way, be a Freemason in order to understand these things. You have, you have to acquire the secret knowledge. Without the secret knowledge, you can't understand it. Otherwise, it's just gibberish. I'm, I'm trying to think of a movie that you might have seen that would get at this best. Uh, I mean, what I wanted to say is the, these Dan Brown books. Yeah, uh, the, 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 uh, the Da Vinci Code. The Vinci code. That's, it's all through that. If you, if you ever see the Da Vinci Code again, or if you've seen it, and if you haven't seen it, part of me wants to say you don't, because it's a lot of nonsense. <laughs> but it's all about the secret society that's carried on forever and ever. It has secret knowledge about Jesus and his family. Uh, this is all part of that same thing, but you have to have the secret knowledge. And I think this is probably where, and I have to apologize because I'm, I'm not familiar with it directly, but I, I still think that the French understanding of Hermetic has to do with this without, I mean, it's, it's gibberish unless you have the key. And that's probably where the idea is still there. Uh, Hermetic is one of those words, by the way, that they often ask, this is for your children when they're going to be going up for exams and when they're trying to get a scholarship. Hermetic is one of those words in English that they often put on post-secondary school exams to see if you know what it means. I'm not kidding, by the way. That, that actually might be useful. If there's anything that comes out of this, write down the word hermetic in that broader understanding and be sure your kids know it. Uh, 
complicated because you said that Pergola was complicated, the code. Yeah. Poor Apollo lived in the fifth century. And it was not for a thousand years before this copy of this book made its way to Italy. What I mean by that is he was a writer who was quite popular in late antiquity. He's cited by a number of other authorities, but by the eighth and ninth centuries, his book ceased to be copied, and the end result is that it disappeared from Europe. So and then it was a copy book was rediscovered in the 15th century. So uh, when when they uh, made this third guy here. Met Hermetic? Yeah. The third god that was between Thaw and uh, uh, Mercury. Yeah, Hermes so, Trismegistus. Yes, when, when it made a manuscript or uh, they translated thoughts into paper, they didn't depend on the Marmolo. No, they, 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 no, the Hermetic texts were in Greek to begin with. Mm -hmm. So the Hor Apollo's book was about understanding hieroglyphs. So it was made in Greek. So, yeah, okay. there, that's yeah. the thing. The Hermetic texts were supposed to be translations into Greek of ancient Egyptian works. Um, but most scholars now believe that they were not translations. They were actually written in the second or third or fourth century so, by Greek speakers. And then they said they were ancient Egyptian translations because that would give them more authority. So it has more to do with their perception of, or maybe they heard the, some interpretations of what is God and how we or we discussed God, so they decided to take that and No, not in that sense. It was actually the text themselves that presented a whole new understanding of God. Or, that's not quite true, it presented an understanding of God that was familiar to them. And so I think that's the important thing, familiar but much older than the written Bible. But we can interpret that ancient wisdom. That's what they were saying, and that the wisdom of the ancient Egyptians, I, this, is, this is such a generalization, please don't, but it's like the wisdom of the ancient Egyptians was almost the same as the wisdom of Christianity. Now this is coming out of Christian Europe. So why did they burn the priest on a stake, a stake on stake? Because there's different ways of understanding Christianity. Uh, for example, I, and now I, this is another roughly four hour lecture, but uh, okay, it was, was, well, for many of you, this is a question that may be quite significant. Was Jesus God or was Jesus man? Was Jesus a man into whom God came, or was he always God? And by the way, those of you, if any of you are Christian, these are actually really important issues in early Christian history. So the church, the Catholic church, was against it because that's what they, what they used to tell the common or the public, they what were, religion they, is. They were not very kind to people who were saying, who, who were giving interpretations of specific aspects of faith that were different than the ones the church faced. And I, I feel, again, if you know the history of Europe in the, the, the 16th, 17th, even into the 18th century, it is such a depressing and bloody history because of the struggle between Christ, Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. But it's, I mean, the, the only positive thing one can say about it, and there's not much, is that this was the forge that ultimately created modern Europe. Okay. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I didn't explain that very well. Thanks a lot for such a very uh, intellectual and interesting. Uh, we will never have a clue or a key of the pyramids have been built. So everyone is making speculations about how it has been built, but uh, after all, it's never been true. Maybe you don't think that uh, we are trying to create things or transform it in something to something that never existed, but I think they don't even have a clue or a key. That's how can to translate these things and to, to put it in a sense that they can understand it in other languages. Maybe they just don't have a key for it. Maybe. Yeah. And to the Hermetic texts, none of these texts talk about the building of the pyramids for whatever it is worth. Right? If the question is, how were the pyramids built and we don't understand how this was done, A, that's true. B, First of all, there could not possibly have been one way in which the pyramids were built. There are some 70 royal pyramids in Egypt that stretch over 700 years. And if you know the pyramids well, you can actually see how in building one, they learned from what they did then, and that was employed in the building of the second, and then building the third. And then at times they do something, and it doesn't work. Let me give you an example of what I mean. You have to, uh, uh, did you all get 
dragged inside the Great Pyramid at some point in your life. Usually this happens when you're in, in this, is, this is in middle school. And you have to go up this thing forever. And Okay, I'm going to be funny about this, but there is only one pyramid in Egypt where the passageway system and chambers are actually built up into the superstructure of the pyramid. By superstructure, I mean the built part of the pyramid. In all of the other pyramids, they're either down into the bedrock, they may pass through a bit of the pyramid, but they go right into the bedrock, and then the burial chamber, or whatever it is, is at ground level, with the pyramid built above it or built down into the bedrock. So that makes the Great Pyramid special. Except, if you get into the burial chamber, if that's what it is, of the Great Pyramid, you have to go up halfway the height of the Great Pyramid, you get into it, it's a room that, I mean, it, it, it's a quarter of the size of the room we're in right now. I mean, it's an impressive space, but it's not enormous. And there's an empty sarcophagus, which many think is not a sarcophagus because it's not terribly impressive. And then you look at the ceiling, and there are these enormous blocks of granite laid across the ceiling with a huge crack going right down every one of them. And one point of speculation is, crack? What are the cracks doing there? And one answer is that they got the engineering wrong. That is, they're halfway up the height of the pyramid, which means the rest of the pyramid is above it. There are millions and millions and millions of tons of weight pressing down on that open volume. So they dealt with this by keeping the space small and then putting huge blocks of granite from Aswan, the strongest stone we know, over the top. But what's enough? Because, okay, here's the pyramid. What you want is to have all of the forces from all the way above acting equally on the ceiling, so it's equally distributed. Instead, it's located slightly off-center, so that the forces are greater on one side than the other, which means that the weight was greater on one side than the other, and probably the cracking happened in antiquity. It might even have happened while they were building. There's even a theory that they never put the king's body, if that's what it was built for, inside, because they were worried that it was all going to come down. And they never did that again. It was too hard to do. They went back to putting the bear. It, to me, yes, it's special because they tried out something new, and they realized this is too hard to do, so they went on to do something else. And the only reason I'm saying this is that, one, we do not have a word-by-word -word description from anybody about how to build the pyramids. But once you study a lot of ancient Egyptian architecture, Keep wanting to hold you longer. I, I, so uh, let me do a quick anecdote. Um, you all know Karnak again. You, several of you pointed out that it was Karnak. Okay, when you visit Karnak, you come up to this huge gateway. It's called a pylon gate, which is a Greek word, by the way, but that's another story. It's a big wall, and the door is right in between the two. So you go to right between the two. And behind one flank of the gateway, on one side, there's this big mass of mud brick jammed up against the wall. It doesn't exist on the other side. So the question is, what is the mud brick doing there? Well, the one thing most tour guides do is they take you around and you stand right in front where that mass of mud brick is passed up against the wall, and then they don't say anything about the mud brick. They ask you to look way up the height of the wall, so you can see up there, and you can see where there's a little Coptic niche that's been carved into the wall. Because there was a church way up the side of this thing at some point in the fourth of the centuries. Okay, that's cute, but what is the church doing up there? The church was built on top of what was a much greater mass of mud brick that was jammed up against this wall. And in the 1860s and 1870s, and this is one of the things you have to always keep in mind when you visit an ancient Egyptian site, none of these sites look the way they did in antiquity. And they've all been changed, even by the process of clearing them and opening them up to be visited in the last century. That is, when, if you were at Karnak in the 1860s, on the inside of those huge gateways, which were the last major things to build at Karnak, you had huge, huge mud brick, built out of bricks, platforms rising up. And at the very top of one of these, that's where the church was built, which meant that in antiquity, this brick thing was all the way up to that height. That's 
still doesn't get at the key question, which is, what are those group things? They're ramps. That's how they got the stone blocks in place. These brick, this, this brick kept rising higher and higher and higher because that was the ramp. We know that the ancient Egyptians used ramps to move large blocks of stone because they survived a number of sites. Now, there are a lot of ways you can think about using ramps to build the pyramids. I, I'm just saying, once you start looking at this, there's lots of things you can start clicking in about. And you know, I, I was just watching a documentary last night. It was basically about how aliens had built the pyramids, because I watch this stuff all the time. And at the end of it, they, again, they were talking about this is impossible, and you couldn't possibly build all this kind of stuff, and so on, and so on, and so on. And all that I'm thinking about is the guy gets in front of the pyramids. He said he'd been there once before, and he said, you just can't come here and stand in front of these things without gasping. I'm sorry, but if somebody was making the comment about how they wish they'd seen more of Egypt. And I, that's understandable, and I hope you do see more. On the other hand, you can see too much of Egypt. I have been to the pyramids at least, I mean, I, I've been at ABC now 40 years. I'm one of the last of the old timers at ABC. And when I say that, since I've been involved with Egyptology and taking people around, I have to have been to the pyramids 2,000, 3,000 times. And I am here to tell you that about the 12th or 13th time that you stood in front of the pyramid, just let you do that on Thursday. And you realize, you really start thinking, this is a big artificial hill. Somebody cut down a lot of stone, which is right next to the site, by the way. We have the quarries. And then they pushed it up hill to make an artificial hill. Why build an artificial hill? That's a question. Why the shape of a pyramid? If you're an ancient society and you want to build big, why is it that so many ancient people built pyramids? It doesn't matter what the material was, whether it was stone or brick or earth. And in, in North America, outside of the city of St. Louis, there are huge mounds that were artificially built in the 16th century that are as big as, one of them is as big as the Step Pyramid in Egypt, built out of earth. And it's easy to say, oh, well, that's Earth. It's easy to move around Earth. Well, listen now, you've got to have a lot of people doing a lot of work over a long period of time, but they're all just carrying little buckets We have a little bit of Earth in it. As a matter of fact, if you can figure out how to move a large block of stone, let's say, efficiently with a group of eight or 10 people, you can move a much larger volume of the material you'll need in that form than if you had to cut it down into lots and lots of smaller pieces. That This is a simple engineering problem. But the thing that I'm getting back at, if you're thinking about the shape, that's really one of the key things. Why do so many ancient peoples build in that shape? And you've got two, well, you've got one common answer. It's because one source, that either Egyptians traveled everywhere, or even the Egyptians got it from the people of Atlantis or something like that. But there is another explanation. OK, um, I don't know if this ever happened to you, but it has not happened to me. But I know people who it happened, and I've seen that this demonstrated. Uh, it's on YouTube. Okay, so you get a two or three or four year old kid. You give them lots of little building blocks. You know, they're all nicely rectangular. They're all dumped on the ground. The kid starts playing. One of the things kids do is they start piling them one on top of another, and you start piling it up and piling it up. And it doesn't take very long before it becomes unstable and swings back and forth, and then it falls down. So the kid does it four or five more times. And then the light bulb goes off, and the kid tries something different. They put down four blocks of stone, all right next to one another, and then two blocks of stone on top of that, and then one block of stone on top of that, because now, as it splays out, you've got a natural stability. And a lot of us think that that's the best explanation of why early peoples who had very little engineering knowledge or science, virtually no mathematical high mathematical skill, when they wanted to build big, they all built in this kind of a shape. And this is not intended to be a joke, but there is a reason why God builds mountains in the way that God builds mountains. They have a natural stability into the shape itself. It is far harder to build this room in terms of engineering science than it is to build a pyramid that would be 150 meters tall. If the lower parts of the pyramid are all, the higher parts are all being suspended on the lower parts. 
and you're depending on the sloping shape to hold things together. But the moment you have to stand over an empty space, some of you probably are engineers. You have to know something about material, the kind of material you're working with, the kind of force that's going to apply, what you can do in the way of columns. And by the way, in the ancient world, you couldn't have a couple of columns in a room like this because your ceiling would come down. So you fill your room with columns, which didn't leave much space for people to get in. I, I mean, these things are all part of the reality of ancient engineering. If you visit an ancient Egyptian site where you can see rooms, they're tiny. That's because you can't, you've got to have a, a limited amount of space to roof over because otherwise there's too much pressure. And when you start thinking in these terms, there is a point when the Egyptians stopped building pyramids on these huge scale. That's because they started shifting the resources they had into more sophisticated and interesting kind of building. And forgive me, whenever I say that, somebody dumps on me. What could be more interesting than a pyramid? And my answer is, okay, you're a king. Your soul is in this complex. Complex consists of a temple, which is the foot of the pyramids. That's where armies of priests, you hope, are going to bring food and things and wonderful stuff throughout your eternal life. And then there's the storage room. That's where your body goes. And then you build this huge billboard on top of it so that everybody will know that you were great. I mean, hey, what, what's the point of the big pyramid? Okay, who built the pyramid? Somebody give me a name. Hmm? Magic. Magic. No, that's how it was built. What's the name of the builder of the great pyramid? Khufu. Uh, 4,600 years later, we all remember the name Khufu. Why do we remember the name Khufu? Because there's this really big thing over on the other side of the river that is associated with the name Khufu. There's nothing else. This guy is immortal because of the sheer size of that mine. And I, what I'm arguing is that the pyramids are the great skull boards ever built. Uh, they're not really tombs, by the way, because except for the Great Pyramid, the body was always beneath it, not within it. They're there. By the way, if you think that the pyramid was built to protect the tomb, if you've got a group of tomb robbers and they want to know where the king's body is, you couldn't possibly have built something bigger as a signpost saying, here's where the king's body is. There's, there are other things going on. And in part, it's obvious, no matter if you're sailing along the Nile, you can't miss it. Part of the purpose of it is its sheer scale. So if you stop building on that scale, it's because there's something else that's more important. And again, I, just to finish this, you're a king. Your spirit is living forever. Now, do you want to live in a 150 meter tall solid structure with almost no empty rooms, no space, no place to walk around in the afterlife, no this and no that? Or would you like to have a nice palace built out of stone with lots of rooms and statues of yourself and all of these other things? With lots of beautiful decorations. And you might think that that's silly, but remember what I was saying that if you built, you guys who built the pyramids couldn't build a room like this, not out of these kinds of materials. Well, this is sort of what I'm getting at. If you've been to the pyramids, everybody makes the point that there's no carvings or hieroglyphs on the outside. And for the most part, there never were. Forgive me, I've been here four years. This is Egypt. And you have wind and sand in that kind of environment. And if you put complex decoration on the outside of the building on the exposed surface, it's not going to last more than a year or so before it's worn flat. Any color you put on is going to be gone within a year or two. You need an interior space, some place that's going to be protected. You can't decorate an interior space if you don't have an interior space. I don't mean to be funny about this, but the early great Egyptian monuments had very little in the way of interior space. They were all solid everywhere. If you go to Saqqara, Saqqara is incredibly exciting because these are Egyptians wrestling for the first time with the problem of translating buildings that they knew how to build out of wood and out of brick into stone. And they immediately encountered problems they couldn't solve, which was, for example, building a one-story tall room that had a roof and stone. So they just filled everything up with rubble because it's all spiritual anyhow. But ideally, if you're in the king's spirit, you want to reach the point where all of that can be truly opened up and decorated. That took <laughs> several hundred years after pyramids began to be built. I, I'm not meaning to denigrate what you said. I, I, I just think there's lots and lots of evidence 
about how the pyramids were built. It's just that, what's well, a lot of things. One, some of it is very mundane. I can take you out to all three of the pyramids of Giza, walk you around them, and you can see at the base of the pyramid, on the rock that we're walking over, endless evidence about how the pyramids were built. You can see, for example, there are little holes that were drilled into the rock that form a huge concentric square that goes all the way around the pyramid where the holes are exactly the same distance apart. Now, somebody did that for a reason. And then, you've got another concentric circle, a square of circles going all the way around. Now you can speculate, why do you do that? Okay, you put a postal here, you put a postal here. This one is taller than this one. You side off of that to make sure that, in other words, all of this has to do with how the pyramids were built. Almost none of this has been mapped or recorded. Partly because it's, this is taking time consuming and it's boring. And a lot of people, by the way, don't want this answer anyhow. They want to know, where are the flying saucers kept? And I, I know that's a joke, but there's, there are academic versions of that. People are looking for the big picture stuff rather than the simple thing. I'll stop with this. My honest opinion is that the genius of the Egyptians who built the pyramids was not a matter of, of technology. I mean, one way or another, they're using ramps. They're moving a lot of stone over a period of time up those ramps. They've got to get it into place. It's all got to be on a schedule. Because people's going to live only a certain period of time. I, I mean, you've got to keep this whole process going. You don't need slaves, by the way, pulling these blocks of stone. You need professionals who know how to move blocks of stone. So forget all of this nonsense about slaves or serfs doing this work. These would not have been members of the high court, but these would have been people, I mean, these would have been real craftsmen who knew what they were doing. And if you think of it in those terms, your real problem is a management problem. Not a technical problem. If you want to know how to build the pyramids, get an MBA. Don't worry about engineering. Because, okay, you've got a ramp. You've got to be moving probably dozens of blocks of stone up that ramp, one behind the other, behind the other, behind the order. You've got to keep everybody going. Everybody's got to keep moving. You've got to worry about, can I do one more anecdote? I know I'm holding you. But a friend of mine was, who works with Dr. Halas, and they're both two of the world's greatest authorities on the pyramid were hired by a film company to build a baby pyramid behind the Mina House Hotel to try out different techniques for moving stone. They learned, for example, that 10 guys could pull a two-ton block of stone a distance of about 20 meters in a half an hour. If you prepare the surface properly, you know what I mean by preparing the surface? Get an eraser, do the shading so that you now are reducing it, and then just run it over it. There are, there are versions of that where you put pebbles down, uh, you still need to control it, however, because if you've got lots of pebbles with a block of stone going over this, what happens when a gang loses control of the block? It's all going to roll back down, and there's another block right behind this with guys who are there. I made mention of this to my friend because they had brought out a stonemason from England who was a specialist working on medieval cathedrals because he knew how to work with ancient stone. And there was a point where they had the stone, they didn't run the stone right on the surface. They put it on wooden sledges. And wooden sledges have been found out of Giza because that reduces the friction point of the things. It's easier to control where you're actually moving the block. So the stone block, which weighs a ton and a half to two tons, is this high above the ground, held up by the wooden sledge. So the stone mason was going over and you know, checking it out and pressing the stone here, putting his hand underneath the stone to see if there was proper distance. And at one point, he put his hand underneath the stone like this, and the wood splintered, and it came down and sliced off one thumb. And they got him in a car together with the thumb. They drove immediately to Australian Hospital. They stowed, they, they sewed the thumb back on, and he had complete control of the thumb within by the next day. And he was really lucky. But all I can think of is, this must have gone on every day in the building of the pyramid. Your problem is not technology, your problem is keeping everything going. How are you going to manage all of this? How are you going to deal with injuries? How are you going to do this, keep everybody fed? And that, to me, is the real genius of the people who built the pyramids, because they're wrestling with this kind of problem in a way that has never been done. People, it's much more fun to think about laser devices doing this and that, whatever, but I don't think that's what the ancient Egyptians did. I, I, I know we're really pressing time now. I'll take one more question, please, and then. Please. I'm sorry, when you said that uh, some people think that 
slaves were used to, I mean, that's what mo mo some of the people think. They use slaves, some others think they use technicians, but I think the, the most power, uh, powerful thing for the ancient Egyptians was, since they were spiritually affected, they would be their face. So they thought that they were building a monument or building a, uh, uh, sort of like a holy place to reach God, so that, that required them to put 100% of their energy to pull that thing off and keep it going until it's done. Okay, I, I'm going to, I don't disagree with you. I, I know that was part of a number of people's conceptions, but the ancient Egyptians were real human beings. And there are moments when we're all deeply invested in our spiritual lives, mm -hmm. and the next moment we're watching the football game. I, I mean, I, I'm just saying that real human beings yeah, I know, but that requires a lot of distractions around them. But uh, throughout the ancient Egyptians, they, they built, they spent a lot of time building temples, and they spent a lot of they time. But, but the guys who were building the temples were specialists. This was their yeah, job. Yeah, specialists must, must be like one or even 10, 20 yeah. of them. But the people who were doing the actual work, they must have a like, creative base. Because if you apply this to even this current days, the people who were committed to Islam or any Christian or Christianity, yeah. they, they will devote their entire faith to, to, to prove something. I, I think there's 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 a fair amount to that. I just have to I'm just saying from my personal opinion, you have to factor in though that human beings are human beings. One last anecdote? Okay. In Luxor, you have the Valley of the Kings. There's a tomb of one of the greatest of all Egyptian kings, Dumas the Third. And you go down these tunnels and this is one of the deep you get into the burial chamber, and the sarcophagus is still there, but this burial chamber was cut into the rock in an oval shape. And some of you know the oval shape is the shape of, of the image that surrounds the king's name. So that was deliberate. And the walls of the tomb were such that from ground level up to about a person's waist height, it was just blue wash paint. And then above that, there was a big red and black line. And then they divided the wall into a series of registers, and then they painted images from sacred texts into the register. And there's one point, it's right behind the sarcophagus, where, okay, you got, you're in the library. This is the place, this is where the king of body is going to go. And if there's any place in Egypt where the mystery is at its most powerful, this is it. So you look along the blue wash, and you come to this point where there's a very strange white rectangle. It's right from ground level to going up like this. With these strange blue lines, vertical lines in it. You look at that and you say, is, is this where the king's spirit is supposed to escape to go out? Is it? I mean, what is this special space? And then it clicks in and you realize what it is. Whoever was painting that wall had a box, and his pigments were in the box, and he had it jammed up against the wall. And he's going around, painting the blue wash, and he gets to the box, and instead of moving the box aside in order to keep the painting going, he just paints around it. And those vertical lines coming down, that's paint driven down. And you're looking at, to this guy it was a job. A really important job. And I, these guys, they would give it, it back to their villages, they made offerings to the king, and I don't think he's denigrating the king at all. It's just it's been a really long, tiring day, and he wanted to get out and go home. Was this like the state of the than any other sarcophagus? Uh, listen, you can go to almost, I know books are a little bit well, and you've got, this, you've got evidence of mistakes everywhere. There's one royal tomb that ran into one of the other royal tombs when they were building it because they, they got the, 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 the angle wrong. Um, there is, in the same tomb I was talking about, there's this point where you have an inscription that is painted along a flat surface, and it's copied from a book. And they're all hieroglyphs. So you've got hieroglyph one, two, three, four, whatever, whatever. You get to this point, here's hieroglyph one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, Black line okay, I have a question. And you realize, well, what I'm saying is, what happened is, and there's another thing too, when you, you can see, you can see the guy painting, because you see at the beginning of the line, it's very dark ink, and it gets 
lighter and lighter, then dark ink, and lighter and lighter, and then dark ink. You can actually see the guy dipping his, but here's the thing. He was copying from a book, copying five symbols, then he's recopying the five symbols. So instead of going to a lot of trouble to plaster over the whole wall again to start again, he just drew a black line through it and went on from that point. I, I don't think it's disrespect to the king, it's just he's, so well, what was that? Was that one of the uh, kings who was buried in Monster? Okay. Uh, and then you have these mistakes we found in the pyramids. Well, as I said, they got the burial chamber cited wrong. Well, that's like technical problems because they weren't engineered. They weren't engineers. Okay, so, I, that's what I'm saying. Lots of technical problems you live with. Yeah. Um, okay. The best I can give you, and boy, I'm really holding everybody here. No. Can I make this the last statement? And it's not the best response to what you're saying. You had made the comment that we don't have any writings about the building of the pyramids. You may or may not have read about this. My experience is hardly anybody did. About eight years ago, a team that was excavating a series of caves along the Red Sea coast, and they were excavating them because they were stopping stations for expeditions that were sailing along the coast. And what I mean by that is if your boat breaks down, you need a new wooden spar or something like this, so they would reposition these things at various points. So they were clearing one of these caves, and they found a cache of papyrus. The papyrus dates exactly to the time of the building of the Great Pyramid. It is written by a guy who mentions at one point that he was an overseer working on the Great Pyramid. But he doesn't then talk about the building of the pyramid because he talks about how he was sent off to Sinai in order to get certain types of special stones that they need. These texts are the oldest substantial writings of hieroglyphs that survive. There's nothing else like them. There are older hieroglyphs, don't get me wrong, but it's just a few, the inscription is very short, it gives some of these names, it's a couple of titles. This is like somebody writing out at length about something, partly because he writes down all of the names of his men and what it is that they're owed. It's like you're getting his diary and his, his, his guidebook and everything else. And I only mention this because it's the only thing we have like this. He doesn't talk about how they built the pyramids, but he clearly was associated with the process he set out by the king to get this. You really get the sense, though, that this is all part of, this is a process, there's all this stuff going on. And the hope is to find more like that, but this just came out of the blue. And it's just astonishing stuff to see. Oh, that, that's, by the way, one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of this stuff, which is, that makes perfect sense to me. That's partly why this stuff is so spectacular. But it's, it's kind of spectacular because beyond the word mundane, it's very simple, very straightforward. And maybe I've just been at ABC too long. I tend to think of everything in terms of being mundane. That's probably also questions. I mean, when he said that the ancient why had mentioned ancient Egypt exerted such uh, renowned animals and other peoples, doesn't have to do with the demographic, geography, I mean, with geography being uh, Italy and all Europe close to Alexandria, more than close to, you know, uh, Americas and even the South America. Actually, I think geography may have something to do with it because of the centrality of Egypt especially in the past, in terms of the world's trade routes. <coughs> I, I said I wasn't going to talk about this, but I, I, okay, I, I'm just going to make a couple of comments, and this isn't enough, but where else in the world do you see anything as old as what you can see in Egypt that is as well preserved as it is in Egypt? In South America. South America? The Mayan. The stuff, the Mayan pyramids are 3,000 years younger than the pyramids in they're still preserved. And by the way, we're still, a, probably they come second in terms of impact because they're so well preserved. But I'm gonna, when the Greeks came to Egypt, they were blown away by the evidence of the antiquity of ancient Egypt and the sheer grandeur of what they saw. If you visited Babylon, and Babylon was probably the greatest city in the world at the time, you'd see big monuments, but you, you didn't see the sense of structure that survived from the past. And this is partly just bad luck. In ancient Iraq, they didn't have stone nearby the building site, so they had to build out of brick. 
and brick is perishable. In Egypt, you've got spectacular building stone not far away from most great building sites. And that means that you can build your most important monuments out of stone in a flats. And I, there is no place in the world where the combination of degree of preservation and antiquity is like what you can see in Egypt. Nothing. There's nowhere. And that really is something that you, I think that's part of it. Is it a Petra in Jordan? Petra is Petra dates to the time of the Romans. That's 2,500 years after. It's, uh -huh. I mean, it was the Romans who were passing through Petra who came to Egypt or were overwhelmed by the age of what they saw in Egypt. And I, I, this is very basic, but human beings are very basic. We respond emotionally to things. The sense of age, size, preservation, it creates a context. And then you can fill in the meaning of all of this the way you want. Okay, here I do have to need to stop. So please forgive me. I, I'm very, very grateful to those of you who have that you came at all, and I'm very grateful for those of you who have stayed. Can, can we answer the last question and just say that it's media for us when it comes to have an interpretation of what's great uh, in context that's not relevant to the uh, That's a really long lecture, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just, I'll say like, let me see if I can do this in two sentences. Human beings, I think it is intrinsic in the human, in human nature that people seek to validate themselves, their ideas, their existence. And part of that is linking yourself with something else. And you want to be linked with something great. We all want to be associated with, with our country is great. It's great because of its history, it's great because of it. I mean, it, it, every culture emphasizes that. And sometimes it, it, every culture creates huge myths that go way beyond the reality because that helps to reinforce the way we think about things. You need myths. Sometimes you need to borrow other people's myths. And I really want to go on at this point, but if I do, I'm just going to be here forever. And I'm going to keep you all here forever. So thank you very much. I'll pause here, and I hope maybe we can have another time to continue this in other ways. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swanson, for your time and for accepting our invitation for today. And thank you all.